Chic. First in electric shaving. Now brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. It was Thursday, November 19th. It was clear in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. Earlier that morning, we'd received a call from Georgia Street. A girl had just been brought in. She was in critical condition. Apparently, she tried to kill herself. This is how smooth your face can feel when you shave with a Schick 25 electric shaver. No matter how tough your beard, no matter how tender your skin, the Schick 25 can give you a close, comfortable shave on all parts of your face. And when you're finished, your face feels almost as smooth as the face of a little boy. Boy, oh boy, really smooth. And your Schick will give you that closer shave with fewer strokes. Why? Because Schick and only Schick has these comb-edged shaving heads that actually comb your whiskers up straight for closer shaving. And along with this closer shave, you get Schick's exclusive colors for men. Remember, your dealer will give you a seven and a half dollar trade-in allowance on any old electric shaver, any standard make. Enjoy closer shave. Get a new Schick 25 tomorrow. Well, how's she doing, Doc? Pretty hard to say yet. We just finished with the transfusion. Uh-huh. She's got a chance of pulling through, but there's no way of telling how much damage has been done to the brain tissue. I see. What about the bruise on her face? Might have happened when she fell. I never knew you gave transfusions in a case like this, Doc. We don't, unless the patient's critical. What happens is the carbon monoxide in the gas joins with the hemoglobin in the red cells, won't let go. Then the blood takes the monoxide through the system and suffocates the brain tissue. We're also giving her coramine to speed up the heart action. It's a rough one, all right. Do you find out who she is yet? Well, according to the stuff in her wallet, her name's Mona Fenton. Oh. But according to the hotel where they found her, she was registered as Mrs. John Loris. Maybe she just got married. That's possible. Identification card in her wallet shows her mother is next of kin. Gives an address and a phone number. We call, but nobody answers. Well, if you reach anybody who knows her, ask them something for me. Sure, what's that? Uh, find out if the girl's been under a doctor's care. Huh? I checked her over when she came in, found some marks. On her arms? Yes, I think she's an addict. At approximately 8.30 a.m. that morning, the desk clerk in a small hotel on Grand Street had detected the odor of gas in one of the halls of the building. Using a pass key, he had entered the room, which was presumably occupied by Mr. and Mrs. John Loris. He found a girl sprawled across the bed unconscious. The gas heater had been turned on full, and the windows had been locked and stuffed with pieces of torn sheets. The clerk had immediately aired out the room and called an ambulance. The girl was removed to Georgia Street Hospital and was still in an unconscious state. Dr. Hall said he'd get in touch with us as soon as her condition improved. We left the hospital and drove out to the hotel. been in here since the other officers left? No, sir. They told me to lock it up until the fellas from Homicide got here. That's you guys, isn't it? That's right. Now, everything is just the way you found it, is that right? Well, yeah, of course, the gas is turned off and I open the windows, but everything else is the same. Over the phone, you said she moved in last night. Yes, sir. At least that's what the registration book says. They checked in at 10.15, her and her husband. 
You weren't on duty at the time, were you? No, I was out to dinner. Who checked him in? Jeff. Jeff Christensen. Is he around? No, not right now, but he'll probably be back tonight. You know where we can find him now? Afraid not. You see, Jeff's sort of our handyman. He takes care of the building. Once in a while, when I got something to do, he handles the desk. This is day off? It's not supposed to be, but you see, he got paid last night. That means he's probably celebrating. Jeff starts celebrating, he's kind of hard to track down. Do you have his home address? Lives here. Hotel gives him a room. I see. Will he be back tonight? Yeah, he only worked a couple of days last week, so he ain't gonna be able to really tie one on. Uh-huh. You get a look at the man who came in with the girl? No, they were already in the room when I got back from dinner. I checked the book and got the money from Jeff before he shoved off. Man must have left sometime early this morning. Guess I was asleep. My room's just back of the desk. He must have got out while I was catnapping. Now, how about calls? Did they make any? Nope, not a one. Like I told those uniform officers that were here before, I didn't hear a peep out of them. Matter of fact, I was thinking how nice and quiet they were. But the way the room looks, they sure must have had some sort of argument. Yes, sir. Do you know if they brought any baggage in with them? Matter of fact, I know they didn't. That's the reason Jeff got the money for the room in advance. Always do. If they ain't got luggage, they gotta pay in advance. Sure looks like they did some heavy drinking, don't it? Uh-huh. That bottle's almost empty. I'd rather empty. you wouldn't touch anything. Oh, sure. I'll call the lab. Right. Say, have you talked to the girl's family? No, sir, not yet. You're planning to see them, aren't you? Yes, we are. Wonder if you'd do me a favor. What's that? Well, I don't much mind the dirty glasses having to clean the room up. That's part of the hotel business. But I wish you'd say something about the way she ripped up these sheets. Maybe if her folks know about it, they'll pay for them. You will mention it, won't you? Yes, sir. Now, who else has a pass key to this room? You mean besides me? That's right. Nobody. Well, where do you usually keep it? Hangs on a nail next to the desk. When you first came in here this morning, was there anything around the door to keep the gas from escaping? Let me think. As I remember, no. There wasn't nothing at the door, just those torn sheets around the windows. Uh-huh. Was the key in the lock? You mean inside the room? That's right. No. Reason I'm sure is I looked through the keyhole, tried to see what was going on. If the key had been there, I'd have noticed it. Uh-huh. Lab crew's on the way. Good. I talked to Doc Hall. How's the girl? About the same. Still critical. He said they're going to move her to general. Oh. Sure hope she doesn't die. That's all we need. What's that? Uh, being in papers gives the place a bad name. Uh-huh. It's hard enough to run a hotel without having someone use it to knock themselves off. Now, you guys will be all over the place. Other tenants ain't gonna like it. Why did it have to happen here? That's what I'd like to know. Well, there's something we'd like to know. Yeah? Why did it have to happen any place? <laughs> talked to the occupants in adjacent rooms. None of them remembered hearing a quarrel or any other unusual noises during the previous night. The crime lab checked the room thoroughly. Under the bed, they found an empty capsule. It looked like it might have contained heroin. Two clear sets of prints were obtained from the drinking glasses. The prints were photographed and the glasses were booked as evidence. The hotel registration card was given to Larry Sloan in handwriting. The names John Loris, Mona Loris, and Mona Fenton were checked through R&I. There was nothing on any of them. We asked the hotel clerk to contact us as soon as the handyman returned. We also asked him to let us know in the event the man who called himself John Loris came back. We checked Mona Fenton's home on Highland Avenue. 12.16 p.m. We talked to her mother. You're sure it's Mona? According to the identification in her pocketbook, yes. It just doesn't seem possible. I guess I should have expected it, though. Ma'am? I warned her. I told her it would never work out. Children are all alike. They won't listen. You try to talk to them, and they say things have changed. You're too old to keep up with the times. Well, she's got nobody but herself to blame now. Yes, ma'am. A girl like her leaving school and taking a job in a restaurant. Most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. If she were still in college, none of this would have happened. Yes, ma'am. Can you think of any reason why your daughter might want to take her own life? I'd be the last one to know. Mona hasn't confided in me for some time. I see. When she left school, we had quite an argument. I haven't talked to her for over a month. Well, doesn't she live here, Miss Fenton? She has her own room with an outside entrance. She comes and goes as she pleases. But I hardly ever see her. I didn't even know she wasn't here last night. Well, has she been ill recently? Not to my knowledge. Why? Well, we wonder if your daughter had been under a doctor's care. No, I don't think so. She's always been a healthy girl. Mm -hmm. Are you acquainted with Mona's friends, Miss Fenton? I used to meet them occasionally. Not lately, though. Was she engaged, would you know? No, I don't think so. 
There was one boy she went with more than any of the others. What's his name? Richard Burdick. Seemed to be a nice young fellow. He and Mona talked about being married, but they were going to wait until they finished school. Of course, when she left college, they broke up. Did they have a fight? Well, I wouldn't call it that. They agreed to disagree, you might say. It was Mona's idea. Richard was still in love with her. At least he said he was. Does your daughter have any other close friends? Miss Fenton. I suppose I might as well tell you. Mona isn't actually my daughter. Oh? You see, I was her father's second wife. Her own mother died when Mona was just a child. I tried to take her place, but I think Mona always resented me. I don't blame her for that. Yes, ma'am. And when her father died, I was all she had. She was all I had, too. Maybe I overdid it, trying to be both mother and father for a child that wasn't mine. She was a little girl. We used to be so much alike. Nobody would have guessed she wasn't my own. We even wore the same dresses. Then all of a sudden, she withdrew. I wasn't part of her life anymore. I don't suppose she's asked to see me, even now. Well, she's still unconscious. You're being kind, aren't you, Sergeant? No, ma'am, that's the truth. I won't go to her unless she wants me. I have some pride, too. Yes, ma'am. Now, this boy your daughter used to go with, what's his name, Richard Burdick? That's right. When did they break up? Oh, seven or eight weeks ago. Was Mona despondent after that? A few times I saw her, she seemed to be in good spirits. Do you know what caused the breakup? Not really. She said her new job was more important than Richard. She kept breaking dates, standing him up. Did Mona have any other steady boyfriends? There was one young man. Matter of fact, he's quite a little bit older than she is. He's picked her up several times in the last month. Do you know his name? No, I never met him. I saw his car parked out in front several times. He'd drive up and honk the horn. He never came inside. What kind of a car does he drive, do you know? I don't think it's an American car. English, maybe. Some kind of a sports car. I see. Do you know the color? He's only been here in the evenings when it was dark. I couldn't say. Did she ever mention this man by name? No, she carefully avoided mentioning his name. How often have they been out together? Four or five times that I know of. Of course, they may have had other dates. Would you recognize him? I'm afraid not. But you did say he was older than Mona. That's right. Well, how did you know that? The first time I saw her meet him, when she came home, I asked her what sort of a person he was. Yes, ma'am. She said there was one thing in his favor that he wasn't an immature child like Richard Burdick, that he was an adult. I see. What about Mona's other friends? Well, there are the girls she works with. I don't know their names, except one of them. Who's that? Peggy, Peggy Gregson. During one of our arguments, Mona threatened to move out of the house and take an apartment with Peggy. I don't know whether she was serious or not. Where is this restaurant where your daughter works? It's on Olympic Boulevard near Robertson. Would you know the name of it? The Blue Peacock Cafe, I think it's called. All right. Do you know the names of any of her other friends? No. During the last two or three months, she has deliberately avoided seeing any of the people she used to know. Did she ever have a boyfriend named John? I think there was a boy in high school she had a couple of dates with. What was his last name? Do you remember? Brewster, I believe, yes. That's right, John Brewster. Does the name John Loris sound familiar to you? Loris? Yes, ma'am. L-O-R-R-I-S. No. No, I've never heard Mona speak of him. All right, Miss Fenton, thank you very much. Well, uh, will they let me know how she's getting along? Well, they're moving her to the general hospital. You can call them there. Before you go. Ma'am. All these questions about Mona's friends and acquaintances. I can't help being puzzled. What about? Do you police always go into such detail? I mean, you said it was an attempted at suicide, didn't you? Well, it looks that way. We aren't sure yet, Miss Fenton. What else could it have been? Well, we're just checking it out now. You mean somebody might have tried to kill Mona? No, ma'am, we didn't say that. You're very discreet, aren't you, Sergeant? Excuse me. 
Hello. Yes, it's... What? Oh, yes, they're here. Just a moment. Thank you. Thank you. This is Friday. Oh? What's the doctor have to say? Yeah. Right. By the way, we have to be leaving Miss Fenton. That call, was it about Mona? Yes, ma'am, it was. Something's happened? Well, has it? I've got a right to know. She's worse, isn't she? Yes, ma'am. She's had a relapse. I think I like the pearl white best. But the aquamarine is so lovely. And the rose quartz and the jade green. How can a woman make up her mind? All the Lady Schick shavers are just breathtakingly beautiful. But that's only part of Lady Schick's wonderful personality. This is the electric shaver that really understands a woman's grooming problems. Lady Schick has a two-sided, gentle action head. One side for underarms, the other side for legs. See how easily it moves over the legs, leaving them smooth and sleek. As for underarms, Lady Schick is so gentle you can use a deodorant immediately after you shave. Lady Schick makes you wonder how you ever got along without it. They're only $14.95. And there are two other models which cost slightly more, one in gold color and one in silver color. And your dealer has them all right now. <laughs> drove over to the Blue Peacock Cafe on Olympic Boulevard. You want to see me? Are you Peggy Gregson? Yeah, why? We're police officers. We'd like to talk to you for a minute. What about? Just a couple of questions. Well, I gotta get the managers okay. I'm on duty now. Sorry, we've already spoken to him. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, hurry up, will you? I don't want to miss out on my tips. I have two tables almost ready to leave. We understand. Like to sit down? Gee, I don't know. It's all right. Okay. What's this all about? You know a girl named Mona Fenton? Sure, she works here. Is she a pretty good friend of yours? I guess so. Something happened to Mona? That's right, she didn't show up this morning. Has she been in an accident? Not exactly. Well, what is it? Miss Fenton's in the general hospital. Yeah? As far as we know, she attempted suicide. Mona? That's right. Why'd she do a thing like that? Well, we thought maybe you could help us find out. Well, I didn't have anything to do with it. You can't think of any reason she might try to take her own life. Not a reason in the world, not Mona. You sure it was suicide? Why do you ask? I was just thinking. Sometimes people try to make it look like a suicide, don't they? Well, what do you mean, Peggy? You know, when they kill somebody. I'll just bet that's what's happened to Mona. Why do you say that? Oh, it's just a hunch. Did she have any enemies? Anybody who might want to kill her? I wouldn't want to say. Well, why not? Mona was your friend. I just wouldn't want to get somebody else in trouble. She's in plenty of it already. He won't find out, will he, that I talked to you? Who? Dick Burdick. If anybody tried to hurt Mona, it was him. Why do you say that? Because it's true. I don't think he's all there. Huh? You know, in the head. He's been coming around here for the last month threatening her. Are you sure he threatened her? Yeah, I heard him half a dozen times. Mona kept telling him to get out. That she didn't want any part of him. To leave her alone. He just kept coming back, making more of a nuisance of himself. When a girl's through with a guy, I don't know why he won't shove off. Was Mona through with Bertie? Sure. She had somebody else on the string. Who was that, do you know? Terry. What's his last name? Gee, I don't know, but he's a real smooth operator. Not like Bertie. Drives a jag. Has plenty of dough. Can't blame Mona for giving Dick the gate when there's a guy like Terry around. Where does this Terry live, do you know? Uh-uh. Mona never said. I guess she was saving him for herself. What's he do for a living? I don't know. But whatever it is, he must be pretty good at it. The way he throws his money around. Did Mona ever mention a man named John Loris? The name doesn't sound familiar. When was the last time you saw Mona? Yesterday. No, it was the day before. Yesterday was her day off. She seemed to be in good spirits? Best. Had a date with Terry that night. 
Did he pick her up here? Yeah, about 9 o'clock. Parked outside, gave a honk. She was just starting to leave when Bertie came in. What happened? He made another scene. Told her she had to stop seeing Terry. Yeah. Told her if he ever saw them together again, he'd kill her. We talked to the other waitresses in the restaurant, and they confirmed what Peggy Gregson had told us. We telephoned Mrs. Fenton and got Richard Burdick's address. He lived in a rooming house on Los Feliz Boulevard. The landlady kept telling us what a good tenant he was. She thought he was in his room. Place is clean. Yep. He moved out. Burdick's landlady insisted that she had no idea when or why he had moved out. His rent was paid up to the end of the month, and he had given her no indication that he was leaving. She gave us Burdick's description and the name and telephone number of his employers. We put in a call, and they told us that he had failed to report for work that morning. As far as they knew, he had not quit his job. to the office and checked his name and description through R and I. Apparently, he had no criminal record in Los Angeles. We got out a local and an APB. 4:39 p.m. We got a call from the General Hospital stating that the Fenton girl had regained consciousness. Frank and I drove over code three. officers we'd like to talk to you I'm sick can't you see that i don't want to talk to anybody the doctor said it'd be all right he doesn't know how sick i am maybe he does wish they hadn't found me that's all i'd be better off and so would everybody else you tried to kill yourself is that right what'd you think i was doing who were you with last night nobody come on miss fenton he wasn't with me we took the room together but he walked out left me flat what's his name terry terry hamilton we were going to get married yesterday, that's what he promised. And it was too late to buy a license. That was his reason this time. And I knew it last night. I knew it was just an excuse. So we had a fight. I told him to get out. He hit me. Go on. That's all that happened. He slugged me and left. So I decided... Well, you know what I decided. Is that the whole story, Miss Fenton? Sure. Guess I'm not the first girl who got jilted and tried to kill herself. You're leaving something out, aren't you? Like what? You're a user. I don't know what you mean. I think you do. When did you start taking him? When I met Terry. That was his idea, too. Guess that's really all he wanted, just to get me hooked. First, it wasn't so bad. I thought I loved him. Then when I had to have a fix, and that's the only thing I could think about, he told me I'd have to pay for it. It was just a business proposition, as far as he was concerned. Uh-huh. If I got a little money, he'd really turn on the romance. When I was broke, he turned off the H. I lied to him yesterday. He said I had dough. I thought I could get him to marry me before he found out different. He found out, though. All right, Miss Fenton, just a couple more questions. Okay. What are they? Do you know Hamilton's address? Sure. When you get out of the hospital, would you be willing to contact him, make a buy? You just tell me when. All right. You better get some rest now. Yeah, I guess so. I'm still pretty tired. Say, do me a favor, would you? What's that? Well, there's a boy I used to go with. His name's Richard Burdick. Would you get in touch with him? Tell him what happened, ask him to come and see me. We, me? We've been trying to find Burdick. Looks like he left town. 
Mm. Now, that's my fault, too. What do you mean? I telephoned him yesterday and told him I was going to get married. He was upset and tried to talk me out of it. I wouldn't listen. He said I was the only reason he stayed in Los Angeles. Well, maybe we'll hear from him. I was wrong about everything, wasn't I? What I tried to do last night, Dick, my mom, everything. Kind of looks like you were. Funny, isn't it? I've always thought of her as my stepmother. Oh? It's the first time I've ever called her mom. March 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. When you're doing the town, fake pleasure, ain't pleasure, knowing anything you do, you want it for Why not smoke for real, smoke Chesterfield? A real high-fi and satisfying Chesterfield. Because you get much more of what you're smoking for in the big, big pleasure of a Chesterfield. Yes, Chesterfield gives you a full, full measure of big, big pleasure from honest, full-flavored tobaccos. Big, big pleasure. Because exclusive Accuray packs them more smoothly to give you the smoothest cigarette you've ever smoked. So why not smoke for real? Smoke Chesterfield. Smoke for real with a Chesterfield. <laughs> the suspect was tried and convicted of the unlawful use of narcotics, a misdemeanor. The unlawful use of narcotics is punishable by a term of not less than 90 days, nor more than one year in the county jail. The court may grant probation for a period not to exceed five years, provided the suspect be confined in the county jail for at least 90 days. Through the cooperation of Mona Fenton, Terence Wilbur Hamilton was arrested, tried, and convicted of violation of the State Narcotics Act of felony. The suspect is now serving his term in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California.